I want to send a great big happy, happy, happy Mother's Day to my beautiful wife, of course. And a nice little shout out all the way down to Virginia, to my mom back at home. Yeah. She's probably in church right now, but like every good mother, she'll be watching her son on TV a little later <laughs> or on the internet. Now, it's not TV anymore, Pastor. We call it the internet. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. She'll be checking me out a little bit later. Uh, but when she does, I wanted to hear how much she's loved and treasured. I love you, Ma. Happy Mother's Day. I tell you all the time, and I, I make no bones about it. The greatest mom in the universe shares my last name. Both of them. The one I came from and the one I married. Amen. Amen. You like how I did that, Minister Mike. See, that was cool. <laughs> I got that in there. Got both of them in there. That was pretty good. Amen. You can have preachers all around who watch this. You can use that. That was slick. You can use that one. But that's a fact. The greatest mom in the, in, in, in the entire universe has the last name Drayton. I mean, I know you all think that your mom might have a claim to that title, but Sorry. Not sorry, you got it, but Deacon got it. She's right there with me. I was reading about motherhood this week, and I found a bunch of really clever observations uh, from some moms about what it's really like to be a mom. Listen to these. I'm going to give you a few of these. I think you'll really appreciate this. Mothers, you're going to love this. Being a mom to a teenager helps you understand why some animals eat their young. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's true. There's nothing quite like being told I'm wrong by someone who depends on me for food, clothing, and shelter. <laughs> my God. I love this. These are some wise, astute mothers. Listen to this. Kids make a lot of plans for people who can't drive anywhere. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to sleep like a baby. I want to sleep like my husband. <laughs> I love it when I catch myself screaming, stop screaming at my kids. That's how I teach them irony. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon, you know who that is? She's an actress. She said this, I always say, if you aren't yelling at your kids, you're not spending enough time with them. <laughs> the majority of my diet, this is what Carrie Underwood said, the majority of my diet is made up of foods that my kids don't finish. <laughs> and this one might be my favorite. I like this one so much, don't ask why. What do you call a petite mother? Minimum. <laughs> Man, that was so good. That was so good. That was, what do you call a petite mother? Minimum. <laughs> um, anyway, you'll get that next week. I'm sorry. All right, let's get into the word. We're already behind time. I told you a couple of weeks ago I had something special for you. Something very fresh today from the Lord. So I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. So grab your pens, your paper, your digital device and get ready. Uh, I want to give you something that was like breathed on me by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Turn to, in fact, don't even turn there. We don't have time. You know what James 1.17 says. It says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from who? The Father. The Father of lights. The title of this message this morning is... If it ain't good, it ain't God. Write that down. If it ain't good, it ain't God. James said every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the father of lights. I probably read that verse 100, maybe 200 times over the last. Well, I'm getting old, so figure a lot of years. And I pretty much understood that, as you have, I'm sure, 
to say that God only gives two things, good and perfect. If it comes from God, it's going to be good and it's going to be perfect. God doesn't give bad, doesn't give imperfect. God gives only good and only perfect, only what is just right for us, perfect for us. That means there's no deviation. That means there's no inconsistency in God. He's not one way today, but another way tomorrow. How many of you know that? Down south, we used to say this, he's not sometimey. <laughs> he doesn't waffle or vacillate back and forth, amen. God is consistent through and through the same always, amen. In fact, if you keep reading, James goes on to say, don't you ever dare accuse God of putting any evil on you when you're being tempted by the enemy. Why? Because God doesn't tempt with evil. God doesn't put bad on you. When bad things are happening to you, they can't be because of God because God doesn't do things that way. He only does things one way, good and perfect. James said there's no evil in God to begin with. That's why he can't tempt you with evil or bad things. He simply doesn't have those things inside of him in the first place. All that to say this, and this is the word of the Lord. If it ain't good in your life, it ain't God. Because God is always good. And I need you to catch that this morning. That right there is the word of the Lord. Get that before we go any further. Look over your life right now. Consider everything happening in your life right at this moment. Think about every situation, every obligation, every hope, every dream, every, 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 everything about your life. Quickly give it a survey. And now ask yourself, is it all good? <laughs> is everything in my life good? Because if it isn't, I can guarantee you, God's not behind it. Just like if it is good, I can guarantee you, God is behind it. Amen. But if it's bad, I got something else to tell you this morning because I just gave you the title and I may repeat this once or twice. If it ain't good, it ain't God. I said, if it ain't good, then the origin, listen to me, the origin of the evil or the bad thing or things happening in your life right now can't possibly coming, be coming from God. Which means there must be another source. Who get this. There must be another source for the bad that you're experiencing. For the evil that has come upon you. And please notice, please notice, I never said anything about the will of God. Don't let that go over your head. Don't let that go over your head. You know why I say that? Because there's actually good and bad in the will of God. Ooh, you better get this. Ooh, you need to catch that. That was a biggie. That was a biggie. I said there's both good and bad inside the will of God for our lives. Oh, somebody out there doesn't believe that. Somebody out there doesn't believe that. They must have forgotten what Paul told Timothy. Uh, all who would live godly shall suffer persecution. They must have forgotten that scripture was written in the Bible. Because that sounds a little bit like bad to me. Amen. Uh, they must have forgotten the other scripture, Minister Mike. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. 
you know, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. They must have forgotten that that's in the Bible because that sounds like a little bad to me. Many are the afflictions. See, God never promised us a bed of roses. What he promised us was that we might have life and that more abundantly. That's what he said. I am come that you didn't say I guarantee it, did he, my call? I am come that you might. That means on some days you might have some good life and have more. But guess what? There might be some other days where you might not have. Well, amen, pastor. But you know what? As many times as I've read John 10, 10, I am come that you might have life and that more abundantly. I've never read a translation that said this. I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly only. I've never found it. If there's a translation out there, let me know, because then I'm going to start claiming that promise. No, I've never read anywhere where Jesus said, I'm only giving you life and that more abundantly only. I've never read third, uh, third John verse two, beloved, I will above all that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers only never read that no I understand what the Bible says the Bible says time and chance happeneth unto them all amen and if you've been walking with God any length of time you already know I'm sure you realize that sometimes we will encounter some bad days some bad occurrences Even some bad or some tragic events. Amen. All of that is the natural order of things. Unfortunately, when you're confined to this stuff called flesh. And you live in this planet where catastrophe and mayhem seem to reign. Uh, you will be subject to those contrary winds. However. When I'm trying to get you to understand, and you got to get this this morning, is this. If unmistakably bad things are consistently happening in your life, then you, me, we need to step back and determine the source. In other words, if God is not the source of evil, thank you, James, if God is not the source of bad or temptation or evil or all of these things that are just horrible, if he's not the source and he's not, then who is? What is the source? Think about that for a second. If God's not the author of all the bad things in our lives, then who, pray tell, is? I won't belabor the point. Here's the answer. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three sources, the three authors of evil in our lives. And we know that because Christian theology is taught for centuries, probably millennia. That those are the three enemies of our soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if you're a believer, it's pretty obvious because you already know. You already know what kind of magnetic pull the world, the flesh, and the devil have in our lives. Amen? And worse, worse, watch this. You already know they have the distinct ability to control our lives. <sighs> and because of the power and the influence that they wield over us, watch this. And sometimes it's even dominance. They, the world, the flesh and the devil, are the only things in this life 
that can actually rival the preeminence of the Holy Spirit of God within us. That's how powerful they are. Here's the scripture. You'll see these three evils in Ephesians 2. I'll read this to you in the New King James. Ephesians 2 verse 2. In which you were, excuse me, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Underline that. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit or the devil. Underline that. Who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. Flesh, underline it. That's all three. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just like the others, the rest of the world. You see how Paul identifies the three enemies? that once ruled us as non-believers and in fact still can if we're not careful as believers. You see that? James said something similar. James 3 verse 14 when he talks about how bitter envying and jealousy and all that stuff and strife is not from God but it's from who? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Look at it. James 3.14. Listen to it. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Don't lie. Don't, don't be deceived. This is not the truth. Don't lie. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. You see that? Earthly. That obviously refers to the world. Natural. That obviously refers to the natural man or the flesh. And devilish. Well, make no mistake, we already know who that refers to. So let me talk to you for a few moments about these three enemies. Because if it ain't good, it ain't God. And if there's bad in your life, then here is how you trace it. It's going to fall into one of these categories, the world, the flesh, or the devil. Let's talk a few moments about them. Let's take them in reverse order for expediency's sake, because I got to get through this. The devil. Well, some things we don't have to explain, do we? <laughs> uh, because every one of us knows everything that we need to know about the devil. He's the antithesis of God. So you already know if the source is the devil. Amen. I'm not going to spend any time there. The flesh. I'll talk to you a minute about the flesh. I'm not breaking any news here. We already know about the flesh. We know the Bible says the flesh is at war with God. Why? Because the flesh has a mind of its own. If there's bad in your life. And it comes from the devil. You can spot that. How about the bad that comes from the flesh? Well, let's look at it. The Bible talks about the flesh being literally against God. Hostile to God. The flesh is not for God. The flesh is actually against God. This body that you live in is literally programmed to go against God. I don't know if you appreciate that. We saw this all the way back at the beginning. Don't look surprised. At the beginning of time with the first two human beings. The first two human beings who, oh, by the way, were placed inside of paradise and given the whole world. And somehow they chose to sin and disobey God. My God. Think about that for a moment. Think about that. The first two humans of our entire species made perfect by God. Given everything, literally, the entire world was theirs. And yet they chose to rebel against God. Despite dwelling in perfection. 
despite dwelling in perfection. Get that because that's the key. They were literally living in heaven on earth. And somehow, Deacon Barbara, that was not enough. Jesus, my God. Somehow, the entire planet and everything in it was not enough. Those two human beings wanted something against the Lord. Against his will, his wish, his desire for their lives. The world was not enough. They wanted something that was against God. That right there is the flesh in action. The flesh is perpetually at war with God. And, a, and I mean anti-God in every respect. Our flesh, whether we realize it or not, this body that we live in as saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost as we want to be. This body that we live in right now desires what actually desires what is contrary to the spirit of God. And that's notwithstanding the spirit of God living on the inside of you who wants or desires what clearly is contrary to the flesh. Amen. Eternally opposed to one another. They are in conflict with each other. So much so that we are not able to do the will of God as we ought to do. We are never able to do all of the things that we should be doing. I didn't say it. The Apostle Paul said it. Paul said it is literally impossible for believers to do all the things that we ought to be doing, which shows you how really strong your flesh is, because Paul was a mighty man of God. You know what? Turn to Romans chapter eight. I'm going to read this chapter to you. I'm going to resist the urge to preach it. But let me point out one or two things to you so you can see how powerful this flesh is and how deep this war between flesh and the spirit of God is. Verse one, therefore, excuse me, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Romans chapter eight, beginning at verse one. There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Why not? Why is there now no condemnation? Keep reading. He tells you because look at this. Those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but by or after the spirit. You see that? There's the reason God no longer condemns us because we walk not after the flesh, but now we walk after the spirit. But if you are not walking after the spirit, guess who condemns you? If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you have not adopted his manner and now are following him, walking after the spirit just like he is, God condemns you. He's not in love with you. But if you are no longer walking after the flesh, not my point. I just wanted to clear that up. I figured somebody needed to see that. But if you're walking after the spirit, then you obviously are no longer under condemnation. Verse two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. And the law of sin, uh, excuse me, from the sin of uh, the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Why? So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, may be uh, made perfect in us. In us, watch this, in us, in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see it again? You see the dichotomy? Now pay attention because Paul is going to start distinguishing between the two. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit what do they mind? 
the things that are of or from the spirit. For to be carnally, fleshly, humanly minded is death. But to be spiritually, Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ, Abba Father minded is life and peace. Watch this. Because the carnal mind, this thing that lives in this body, is enmity against God. The mind of the human being, the carnal mind, this body that we live in, is enmity, completely contradictory, completely contrarian, like two rams fighting, bucking head to head against each other, against God. Why, Paul, is the mind so warped against God? Because, keep reading, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. You see that? In other words, our natural minds are not really under the rulership or jurisdiction of God's righteous law, which is why, keep reading, verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If all you have is your flesh and you lack a born again spirit, your mind is totally against God and God is totally against you. And oh, by the way, you cannot please God. The NIV says it this way. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It is impossible for your mind to become a Christian. It cannot submit to God. It does not submit to God, and it can't. Your, your mind cannot become a Christian. Your mind can't do enough to be Christ-like. It is impossible. Not only does it not do it, it can't do it. This body can't clothe itself with any righteousness, which is why the Old Testament law could only cover sin. We needed a whole new mind change. We needed to um, begin, uh, begin again, get born again. That's the only way that we can have sin eliminated from our lives. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. That's what the NIV says. In short, the two are literally polar opposites. North Pole, South Pole. Verse 9. But if ye, excuse me, but ye... I told you he was going to distinguish, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If I hope you saw that, if if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, big if right there. Meaning he's only talking to real Christians. <laughs> you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Not talking to the fake ones who just put a Christian robe over this flesh. Oh, yeah, I'm Christian. I'm Baptist. I'm Methodist. I'm this. I'm that. I'm Christian. I just put it on. That's what that's. No. Nah. If so be. The spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Get that. Get that. Jesus isn't the only one that says unless you come through me, you're not getting into heaven. Paul says it here. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, that's why every religion on the planet who decries the name of Jesus who says it's not Jesus. You can get to God this way. You can get to God through Buddhist uh, way and through Muhammad's way and through this way and through that way and through all these. 
any religion, any, any, any philosophy, any, any idea that says you can get to God outside of Christ is an old wives tale. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, Christ is none of his. He's not a true Christian, in other words. And if Christ be in you, the body, this flesh, is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life or the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he, the spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies. He can get a hold of this mortal body. How? By his spirit that dwelleth in you. So this flesh may be wretched and totally against God, but once the spirit of God gets deposited in this old trash can, he can transform this trash heap into a mighty treasure. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We're not in debt or under subjugation or, or, or under the rule of the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. How do you bring the body under subjection? By the spirit, not by how many verses you can quote, not by how often you fast, not by praying for 30 hours. You bring this body, you make this body serve the Lord, how? By the spirit of God inside you. Listen to these last two verses again in the NIV. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now, what did I tell you a moment ago? The flesh and the spirit are eternally opposed to one another. They are at constant war. Which is why Paul tells us a little later, that was chapter 8 in Romans 13, verse 14. Listen to this. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't put on Pastor Todd. Don't put on Mama or Papa. Don't put on this wise leader or that wise leader. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you act like anybody in planet Earth, it should be the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and if you do, Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. How do I stop the flesh from having preeminence, from gratifying its desires, satisfying itself, doing what it wants to do, which we've already established is everything against God. How do I stop my flesh from doing everything against God? I put on Jesus Christ. I talk like Jesus, I walk like Jesus, I act like Jesus, I think like Jesus, I see things the way Jesus sees things. I have the spirit of Christ living in me and I let that spirit express itself 100%, not 99. Paul said this to the Galatians, verse five, chapter five, verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus to who? Notice he's not talking about God. Notice Paul has never once said anything about God. Everything about our walk has to reflect Jesus. That's why we're called Christians, not Godians. 
Godites. We're called Christians because we mimic and model and follow the example of the Christ. Beware of people who say, I believe in God and all they believe in is God. Those people will miss God and go right to hell just like the rest of the world. No, it's the name of Jesus that saves. There's only one name under heaven by which men must be saved, and it ain't God. It ain't Abba. It ain't Jah. It ain't Yahweh. It's Yahweh saves. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus. Once you go through the door of Jesus, now you have access to Yahweh, to Abba to Adonai, to El Shaddai. You can get to God, but you got to go through Jesus. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The more you belong to Jesus, the less your flesh can have its own will, its own passions, its own desires exerting itself. Can you say amen? And that right there is the whole point of the matter. God is not in our flesh. He's in our spirit. So if you're being led by your flesh and not by your born again spirit, then you already know what I'm going to say. That's a problem. I said that's a big problem. Amen. Amen. And that right there is the second enemy. That's the second source of bad in your life. Having the flesh do what it wants. Third enemy. The first one was the devil. The second one is the flesh. The third one was who? The world. And by that we mean the world system. The manner in which the world operates. That's what we're talking about. How many understand what I just said? The world in and of itself isn't bad. The heavens declare your glory. This world is great. The world is great. It's the system that operates in this world that's bad. Everything God made is beautiful, is wonderful. The rocks cry out, the mountains. You read those Psalms and how it personifies nature. Rocks have a voice because they sing praises. Mountains bow down and mountains have a posture of worship. This world is great. It's the system in operation in the world that's bad. I said the world has its own operating system like Android and Apple. Amen. Its own way of seeing things, embracing things. Believing things, doing things. The world has its own way of understanding things. Its own way of relating to things. Its own way of behaving. Amen? The world has its own way of existing. And with little exception, very little exception, everything about the world system is anti-Christ. And you don't have to take my word for it. Open the New Testament after the book of John and read every single epistle. Every single New Testament writer writing anything about the system of the world does so in a manner that condemns the world and its antichrist system. So much so that we as believers are both instructed to abandon and condemn if we fail to, excuse me, condemned if we fail to abandon the world and all our ties to its system. I'll give you an example. Write it down. First John 2 verse 15. 
Here's the Apostle John. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone, anyone, anyone sitting up in church Sunday after Sunday claiming they're a Christian. Oh, it doesn't say that, but he's writing to us, the believers. If anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in them. Jesus. My Lord, I hope you see that. Paul, take you back to Paul, Romans chapter 12. You know, this, this is the famous Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is the acceptable, good and perfect will of God. Right. One translation says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. See, there is no scripture in the Bible that says the world is good. Act like it. Every time they got an opportunity to address the world in this system, condemned. Why do they condemn it? Because Paul talked about it earlier. God condemns the flesh and the world. He embraces and loves the spirit. Corinthians. Paul said this to the church at Corinth. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Second Corinthians 10, three. That's not the King James. You know, the King James says it this way. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But this translation says we don't live in the world and we don't wage war. We live in the world, but we do not wage war as the world does. How about Jesus, disciple, Matthew? Listen to this. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Matthew is literally saying, what good would it be for somebody to gain the whole world, every treasure, every pleasure, every good thing in it. And then turn around and have to forfeit their soul. Because you can't have both. It's either God or the world. I'll give you one more. I'll let you think about that. James. James said this. Chapter four, verse four. You adulterous people. He's talking to the church. <laughs> you got to get that. Oh, my God. Adulterous. I could substitute adulterous and, and put the word prostitute in there. And then we have some even more crude words for prostitute in our language. This man of God just said that to the church. You cheating, lousy. Something. You adulterous. People, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity? The same enmity we talked about with flesh and spirit is enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses. Oh, you got to get that. You got to get that. You got to get that. It's a choice, folks. It's not a trick of Satan. It's not a deception, my call. It's a choice. Jesus. We choose this stuff. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Seems to me it's pretty clear. And hopefully to you, that the way the world operates and the way the Christian is supposed to operate, two very distinct things. Can you say amen? Now, let me give you one small caveat. One small caveat. If you were listening closely, I told you a few moments ago, 
with little exception. Everything about the world, everything about the world system is against God and his word and his will. Everything with very little exception is the antithesis of God if it's found in the world. That's true, but hear me on this very subtle point. I have to make a very subtle point because I never want you to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The one exception to this truth is this. Sometimes, some things operating in the world are actually consistent with the word and consistent with the will of God. Sometimes, sometimes. Like what, pastor? Well, global humanitarian efforts, there's one. You know, when we run around the world and try to feed the poor and try to put food in the mouth of babies that are starving. Like when you see a politician stand up and address homelessness or try to address homelessness. When we bring aid to the down and out, you know, whether it's a bunch of hurricane victims um, down in Haiti or earthquake victims in uh, the tsunami place over there in Asia, flooding in New Orleans. When you see the world rally to minister to the needs of people or to render, or render some kind of aid or show mercy or kindness or just show some love and support, those are clearly good and per those are clearly attributes of God, right? So that is the one rare exception where something in our world, our system of operating in the world actually does something that is consistent with God, where they're not at enmity with God. I guarantee you, if you trace it all the way back to the source, it's a godly influence that's bringing it about. It's not the world all of a sudden having a God moment. It's somebody in the world operating under influence somehow. Maybe somebody's praying and touch the heart of this heathen king. Praying, touch the heart of this heathen president. Praying, touch the heart of this heathen prince or ruler. And somehow those initiatives spring into action. So generally speaking, not everything in the world is reprobate or void of all intrinsically good value. Not everything, not everyone. Hear me. Not everything, not everyone in the world is awful or terrible or the antithesis of God. All that to say this. There is some good in this world. Why, Pastor? Because God, through us, is still working in this world. That's why you see a little bit of good in here. So don't give up on the world or its people. Don't throw it away. Don't flush it like the toilet, like the bath water. Don't cancel the culture. <laughs> They can wear 30 earrings in their nose and teeth and mouth and navel and pinky and <laughs> tattoo their face and tattoo their body. They can dress differently than us, talk differently than us, walk differently than us. Don't be turned off when you see the world, well, acting like the world. <laughs> it's not necessarily the people, it's the system. They are programmed by their flesh and by the system. And because they have no spirit of God in them, certainly under the rule and the control of the devil, the flesh, the devil, the world. 
I told you a minute ago, God made this thing beautiful. But it has since been perverted and misappropriated by its diabolical ruler. But I still believe the world has capacity to do good. I see it every day. And the reason for that is very simple. God has never given up on this world and neither should we. Can you say amen? Amen. The Bible says God so loved the world. The world, the corrupt, perverse world. He so loved it that he gave his only begotten son. Right. And that right there is exactly why his godly influence can still be seen throughout this world. Amen. I hope you understand what I'm saying now. All that to say this. All that to say this. We can't become Christian elitists. <laughs> oh, get that. Meaning, don't ditch the world. Oh, it's, it's us and we're in a clique now. We don't have anything to do with them. No, don't be that way. Because you were there just a few minutes ago. You ain't been walking this thing that long where you, come on now. I, that, you missed a good place to say amen. I think you missed a good place to say amen. I said the world is still as much worth saving today as it was when God sent his only begotten son. Amen. Now, let me bring this thing home. I'm closing in about 10 minutes. Here's the point of everything I just said. If it ain't good, it ain't God. If what I just said is true and God is the source of only good and only perfect, just right things for us. Then what I just taught you is equally true. The only source for bad or evil things in our lives is the world, the flesh, or the devil. And therefore, as I postulated earlier, if there's anything bad in your life right now, it is incumbent upon you to figure out the source. Is the source of the bad in your life God? Of course not. Then there must be another source. And oh, by the way, I just told you there are only three sources. The world the flesh, and the devil. So let me ask you flat out, which one are you serving? <laughs> which one are you serving instead of God? There's only three. Who's controlling your life and bringing bad or evil into it if it's not God? Who's your master if it's not God? Because we know for certain God's not the master of evil. He's not the master of bad. Who are you serving instead of God if there's evil and bad happening in your life right now? Here, let me make it plain. That's too, too atmospheric. It's too, too amorphous, Mike. I'll come down on street level. If your marriage is bad, don't blame God. <laughs> well, amen, pastor. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. I got my own amens. You can be stingy on yours. That's okay. I got a few left. <laughs> if your checking account is bad, don't you dare blame God. Uh-uh. 
If your relationship with your parents, your co-workers, your friends, your children, your boss, if all of those relationships are flat out terrible, you better not blame God for that. Oh Lord, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Oh God, why is your will so hard for me? Oh, it's just too hard, God. No. God has nothing to do with any of those failures in your life. There's another source. And I just told you it's either the world, the flesh, or the devil. See, a lot of times I was talking about marriage a moment ago. A lot of times we pray and pray and pray so hard. And so that perfect spouse, God gives them to us. And we turn around and blame God when it all goes bad. <laughs> I thought God was the giver of good gifts. I thought God was the giver of perfect gifts. Not bad ones, right? So if the marriage has gone bad, it ain't God's fault. Oh, that might be tough to hear. But we need calcium for the bones, broccoli. I don't know if we need beets. Is that, I don't, we don't need beets. We need broccoli though. We need a lot of broccoli, don't we? No. The marriage is going bad. It's not God's fault. I'll tell you whose fault it is. It's the mirror's fault. You'll get it driving home. What do you mean the mirror? I ain't going to make you wait. Never mind. I'm going to tell you. I'm, here's the punchline. The man in the mirror. That's whose fault it is. Amen. Or. If it's not. The man in the mirror's fault. It's your reliance on the world's way of doing marriage. That's whose fault it is. The world's system. See, it's either the flesh, the world, or the devil. So you've been listening to too much Oprah or whoever your person is out in the world. Or, and I don't mean to single out Oprah, but she's the first one that comes to mind who does talk shows or Ellen or whoever the Kelly and Ryan or whoever the people are. Who's the new one? Oprah Sven, Gail, Gail, she just took over good. What is it, Good Morning America? Is, is, she, is that what she is, Gail? She was just a friend of Oprah. Now she's, she's the big cheese now, I noticed that. She used to just hang around Oprah's book club. You remember 20, 30 years ago, she was just a friend. Now she's in charge of that network practically. You rely too much on the world's way of doing things, doing marriage. Or well, I guess it could possibly be the devil's fault. If it's not the flesh and if it's not the world, it's gotta be the devil. And yeah, it can be his fault. Like when he strategically plants Bathsheba <laughs> right across the street from your open window. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? I don't need to explain that any further. In fact, let me just let me take a step back because I think I shortchanged the devil a moment ago. I didn't even talk to you about the devil. I'm going to say one. Two, uh, let me just one or two things about the devil. Thinking about that Bathsheba thing, just. I, I need you to recognize his interference when it happens in your life. Look at this. The Bible says the thief cometh not, but for to steal, kill or destroy. Right. Right. So that must mean if there's any killing, stealing, or any destruction in your life, we know the source, right? We know the source, right? The burglar breaks into your home is on the payroll of Satan. Isn't that right? Amen. The home wrecking co-worker who keeps trying to wear down your defenses. I ain't talking to the women, I'm talking to the men. By asking you to take fire into your bosom. You better read Proverbs if you don't understand what I'm talking about. Can a man take fire? Yeah, uh-huh. Can he walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? Uh-huh. Keeps asking you to take fire into your bosom. 
Well, you know that's an agent of Satan, don't you? You should. That's not, God didn't send that person there to, to boost your esteem and get your confidence back. That's, that's not a gift from the Lord. The rapist, the abuser, the murderer, all agents of Satan. Sickness, illness, disease, all agents of, agents of Satan when it's objective. When its objective is to kill, steal, or destroy. Or in other words, cut short your life and prevent you from living out the full length and number of your days and fulfilling all the will of God for your lives. Illness that comes in to kill, steal, and destroy like that, there's only one source. Illness that comes in because I keep eating a steady diet of fried chicken, that's not the devil. We can trace that back to this right here. Bottom line, if we look for it, we'll find out whether the bad things in our lives are sourced in the world, the flesh, and the devil. So my challenge to you today is to get you, as well as myself, to go out there and look. Go take inventory of your life. Start going over things with a fine tooth comb. Track down the true source of your bad, of your evil, of your unhappiness, your catastrophe, your calamity, great calamity that has come upon you. Because I'm here to tell you in defense of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God has not doomed you to a miserable life. I read somewhere, he wants us to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and from life to that more abundantly. That's what I read, I, I don't know about you. So if that's not your existence right now, I suspect there's another master in your life. I suspect there's another ruler another controller in one or more areas of your life right now. You probably have a trespasser. Hmm. Someone or something illegally squatting on your property. Someone or something illegally, squat, illegally squatting in your marriage. Someone or something illegally squatting in your health. Someone or something illegally squatting in your career advancement. Someone or something illegally squatting in all your relationships with everyone because you can't get along with nobody. Amen. It's about time you got rid of the squatters. You need to repossess your possession. Can you say amen? God told me to challenge you this morning. Check the source because if it ain't good, it ain't God. Check the source. If it ain't good, it ain't God. Instead, it must be either the world, the flesh, or the devil, which means you're probably yielding to a counterfeit master. Not named Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. And you may not even realize it. Amen. Last caveat. One final caveat to what I just said. And that's this. Always remember that time and chance happeneth unto them all. Remember. Just keep this in the back of your mind. I told you sometimes God allows a bad thing to come into our lives for his sovereign will and his sovereign purpose. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. We simply have to have the will to obey. Unfortunately, there's no way this or any other pastor for that matter can tell you all the innumerable reasons why God allows certain bad things to happen to us. 
And I don't care if it's cancer or heart attack, car accident, sudden tragedy. Those things do happen. And like I said earlier, sometimes they happen to be inside the will of God. You know, just like Jesus's crucifixion was. <laughs> that was squarely inside the will of God. Paul's many beatings and stonings and nearly drowning. All of that's the will of God. And we see it play out in scripture. So every so often, every so often, because I told you earlier, God's not doomed us to a miserable life. Every once in a while, every blue moon or so, some great challenge or some great attack by the enemy will spring upon us. And we will all have to deal with that. Because like I told you before, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Can you say amen? But for everything else, the consistently bad, the everyday bad. This thing has not changed in years bad. The stuff that we can't avoid, it's always before our face bad. Everything else, it's incumbent upon us to check the source. Come on, church. Uh, have I adopted the world's point of view in this area of my life? Or am I just in the flesh? Maybe that's it. Maybe this is going wrong because maybe I'm just fleshing out. Uh, maybe I'm still in charge of this area of my life instead of yielding it to the Holy Spirit of God. Or maybe perhaps it's just the devil who comes in like a flood every once in a while. Amen. Either way, check the source because... If it ain't good, it ain't God. <laughs> There's got to be another source. Final words, final point. Listen to this. I'm done after this. And this is the other side of the coin. So listen very carefully. Let me see if you catch this. If it ain't good, it ain't God. Ooh, there's a little distinction. I shifted on you. Listen to it again. If it ain't good, it ain't God. You didn't get it yet. Let me say it this way. If it ain't good yet, it ain't God. Come on. Get that, get that, get that. I just told you, the Bible says God only gives good and only gives perfect gifts, right? So that must mean that if you're a believer and God is on the case, then it's only a matter of time, Jesus, before it gets good. Can you say amen? Oh, I better say that again. If it ain't good yet, just hang in there, Dorothy. Just keep fighting. That's all. Because your God is a God that only gives good and only gives perfect, okay? Which means he's still at work in your situation. He's still turning it into good. That's what that means. If it ain't good yet, it ain't God. He's just, he's just working. On, he's still massaging that clay. He's still molding that solution. He's still crafting that perfect resolution to whatever it is that you got going wrong in your life. Just give him a couple more minutes, a couple more days, another week, another year, whatever the case may be, because he will certainly come through for you. Amen. Here, try this on. Ye have need of patience. <laughs> After ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. What promise? Of only good, only perfect. Can you say amen? Listen to this. Brandon Lake has a song out there that goes something like this. Let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. Dorothy, he's not done with what he started. 
He's not done until it's good, Jesus, my God. You see that? I, I caught that one day right out of the air. My God, Brother Brandon wrote that song. Let him turn it in your favor. See, we got to give God time to work. I heard a preacher say recently, uh, we got to be patient with the Lord. Hmm. In fact, for many of us, the issue is not at all about whether God is good or not. The issue is not whether we're experiencing good or experiencing bad. For many of us, the issue is patience. Mm. The Holy Ghost would say, we are the very ones he's talking to when he says in Hebrews 10, 36, ye have need of patience. So he's going to use this difficulty we're going through right now. Somebody sang an old timey song saying how even the darkness eventually comes to light. He works in both of those. He'll use this difficulty we're going through right now to work some Holy Ghost patience in us. <laughs> the Holy Ghost said, it's not a question of am I good? I'm good. That's not the question. That's already established. Of course, I'm good. The question is, do you have any patience with God? That's the question. Do you have the ability to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, young Timothy? Or does everything have to be on your timetable? <laughs> when you say, how you say, the way you say it must be. I wonder if that's the issue. I wonder if you've tracked down that source like you're supposed to. Because that right there is the real question. And I believe that's why Minister Mike preached on patience last week. And I believe that's exactly why God had that man write that song. Let him turn. Let him. You have to let him. Let him turn it into your favor. In other words, allow God the time he needs to do what? Romans 8. Work all things together for your good. Can you say amen? Amen. Allow God the time he needs to prove to you that he meant it when he said, God always causes us to triumph. How? Through Christ Jesus. And if we do that, like the song says, we'll be able to sit back and watch him work it for our good. Can you say amen? amen. I'm telling you, God's not done with what he started. Oh, you're not hearing me. I, do I need to play the song for you? God's not done with what he started. I'm telling you, God's not done until it's good, until it's perfect, just right for you, Jesus. I'm done. I pray this hits home with you, especially you moms out there. I didn't forget about the moms because your work never seems to end. <laughs> Moms are the ones, the most, who always have to endure. We all had bad situations in our lives. I can guarantee you God's not the source out of any of them. I'd be willing to bet a million dollars if I had it, that the source is going to be found in either the world, the flesh, or the devil. And so the good news today is we have the ability, no, the authority, the power, the wisdom from God to defeat all three of those enemies. Amen. So I want you to leave here with three things this morning. Number one, God only bestows good things and perfect things upon his people. Number two, if there's bad or evil or confusion or chaos consistently in your life, if your life is one crazy episode after one crazy episode after another, check the source. It's probably either the influence of the world, the flesh, or the devil. 
the world, you're operating in a system that's really not yours. The flesh, you're making some choices that are antithetical to God or the devil. You're just being attacked. But it's one of those three sources. And the last thing is this. Number three, if God is on the case and he most certainly is in the life of us believers, then it's only a matter of time before he works all things together for your good. Amen. amen. God is a real good God. Can you say amen? amen. If it ain't good, it ain't God. Clap your hands and give God some praise. I'm done. How many of you received that word from the Lord? How many of you going to take some inventory and start checking the source? This thing has been going wrong a very long time. I better trace the so track that source down. I'm going to be an FBI agent this weekend. I'm going to go look and find my uncover every clue. I figured it out. That's where I got out of line. See, that was the flesh. It wasn't you, God. It was the flesh. How many of you going to check it out? How many of you going to check the source? How many of you going to be patient with the Lord and let him finish working things out for you? You going to do it? Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray for you. Father, I bless you, Lord. I have given your people the words that you've given me to share with them. I pray not only that they hit home, but I pray, Father, that these words find good soil in the hearts of your people so that they can grow up and produce a tree of life a tree of plenty fruit so that your people will be fruitful, that they will literally bear good fruit from what they've heard today. I pray right now in Jesus name that you would give us keen insight and discernment so that we can see those areas where the enemy has come in, where the world's system or operation a uh, manner of operating has crept in, has become a trespasser or where we have just in our own choices made some terrible choices, some bad choices, and we're reaping the fruits of those choices. Help us to identify. And once identified, help us to rid ourselves. Like I said before, get those squatters off our property. I pray you do that for us and give us the strength and the grace to follow and serve you to the best of our ability every single day of our lives, that we might be more Christ-like in everything that we say, do, think, or otherwise. I bless you for doing it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Amen.